I'm Lucy Popescu, Chair of the Authors Club, and I'm delighted to be interviewing Nikita Lalwani as part of our online series of literary events. This is our first Lit Lunch online. Welcome, Nikita. Hi, Lucy. So Nikita Lalwani was born in Rajasthan and raised in Cardiff. Her debut novel, Gifted, was longlisted for the Man Booker Prize, shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award, and won the Desmond Elliott Prize. She was also nominated for the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year. She now lives in London. Her latest novel, You People, focuses on the plight of Sham, a Sri Lankan asylum seeker working in an Italian restaurant in London. Vesuvia's owner, Tuli, is an enigmatic character who employs and aids illegal migrants, but no one knows his true motives or where he gets his money. Shan is desperate to be reunited with his wife and child, but is terrified of being deported before he finds them. Balwani interve interweaves Shan's story with that of Nia, a young woman who fled a drunken, abusive mother in Cardiff for Oxford University, but failed her first year. She works alongside Shan and is trying to make sense of who she is and what she wants. Balwani explores another side of London's multiculturalism and eloquently describes the prejudices, financial pressures, and loneliness faced by outsiders trying to get by in a difficult, sometimes hostile environment. I'm gonna to talk to Nikita about her inspiration and creative process and find out what she's working on next. I wanted to, dis to discuss you people to mark Refugee Week. Shan is an asylum seeker stuck in the UK system terrified that he won't be believed and that he will be deported. You brilliantly convey his alienation and loneliness. What was your inspiration behind Shan's story and what do you hope readers will take away? I think uh, it's, it's really interesting you say that, um, that, that he's, I mean, you capture his isolation really well in that intro. Lucy, what I was trying to do, I guess, was walk in his shoes, which felt at times to be audacious, but also felt very necessary um, to just try and inhabit him in a three-dimensional way so that all of the ideas of difference that are built up in the novel um, hopefully start to blur around the edges. So you mentioned that the book's told from two alternate points of view. Nia's come in from Wales, Sean come from Sri Lanka. Nia's come voluntarily to escape um, a, a home life that she's not happy with. Sean has come because he feels that he has no other option. And in a sense, Nia's in the front of the restaurant, she's in the front of house, Sean's in the kitchen in the back, and it's this bleed through and this commonality that I was interested in what happens through proximity um, when those two worlds get closer and closer together and they get sucked into each other's stories. So I guess the answer to the question is that I wanted to think about what we had in common, I guess, to coin a phrase. Was there a specific person that you based um, Shan on? Was there a, a, you know, a story that you knew that you based him on? Well, the restaurant is definitely based on a restaurant that I used to frequent where there was a Thule like figure who is the um, proprietor who plays a role that's somewhere between Godfather and, the, and Robin Hood, I guess, in the book. So Thule in the novel, it runs a kind of Solomon's Court where people can come if they have trouble and if they can't, they don't have recourse to things like legal aid or a way of reuniting with your family or even to loans or a bank account. And the restaurant sort of, was this bubbling hub that I used to visit. And so Sean is a kind of amalgam of various stories that turned up at that time when people were fleeing the Sri Lankan war. Um, but as I was writing it, I felt that that time is so relevant now. So I was draw I'm drawing on this time gone that still feels to, you know, sort of very important right now. But that idea that it was a melting pot and that you could go there and tell your story and that there might be somebody to help you um, legally or illegally, that was of interest to me novelistically. 
And how much research did you do to, to um, ensure, ensure that Shan's story rang true? Um, in particular, his desire to run without his family. Many refugees do this and, and then their motivations are questioned because um, they're told they can't be genuine because if they left their family behind and if it was so dangerous, why didn't they travel together? So did you have to do quite a bit of research on, on this? Yeah, I did actually. Uh, I used to work as a documentary maker and I still think that those skills are quite important to me when I write fiction. Um, on the interpersonal level, I kind of listen a lot and intrude and I'm a bit voyeuristic and ask sort of searching questions that aren't always welcome. But I also apply sort of general journalistic skills. So I, I spoke to lawyers who deal with asylum cases um, and I also sp spoke to Freedom From Torture. Oh, yeah. Um, and so... I, I did research on oral testimony um, from refugees who were fleeing under duress. And one of the things that, a few things came up that made it into the storyline. One of the things that came up was that you can suddenly be offered a slot. You could be asked to wait for months and then suddenly a slot can turn up as happens with Sean. And it's a ho horrible moment where you think, shall I just sort of change my whole life and, and, and throw my, you know, whole, life in with these people who are saying that they can take me across and then and believe that I can come back and get my family or that they'll bring my family later on. Um, characters who are sometimes you know doing their best to bring people over illegally and sometimes are quite unsavory and so it's very difficult to judge just as it would be with any service you know under duress and so that was that was quite a, that brings an urgency to Sean's story. The other thing that came up was that the the PTSD that people who have had torture in their family suffer, and how that impacts your ability to try and build a life in this country or in the country that you end up in. Once you get there, it's not just so easy as one might imagine. You know, you can't just sort of suddenly just start working without these interruptions of PTSD and the stress and the strain and um, the fact that some people end up suicidal and some people are very bruised by what they've been through, but they're involved in building a life, the likes of which they've never experienced before. The urgency to build a life so that your family can join you is huge, to be able to have a room to sleep in and have an ability to earn money. And so a lot of that came from journalistic research, um, but also it was thinking back. Um, I mean, my father was a refugee through partition, the partition of India from um, in the 40s. And so the idea of displacement has, has been there in our family for a long time. So some of the research in inverted commas is, I guess, deeply subconscious mm. as well. And um, I love the way you inter interweave it with Nia's story. She comes from Cardiff um, and she has to adapt to life in the capital as well. But tell us a bit more about her. She's a wonderful mix of tough and vulnerable, brave and questioning. Is there a little bit of you in her? Well, I, I mean, I, I'd hope there's a, a bit of me in Nia. Um, I think there's a little bit of me, of me in, in Nia and in Sham. Um, when, as in there, the focalizers of the story, they're both telling the story. Um, I guess I, Nia is, is, is struggling with a, a lot more of a, a, of a challenging background than I had growing up, but definitely her desire to make something of herself through reading is something that is linked to me. So she's very reliant on the library growing up, which I was for my education. Um, in Cardiff, as in the freedom that it affords her, and that it's beyond class and it's not linked to cash flow in any sense, that you can pick up three books and discard two. And that idea that there's the, there are these oceans of books available to her so she can forge her own way and leave um, the very dark environment that she's growing up in. Um, I guess that comes from me. So she's near 19 when she joins the book. She's she's got she's grown up on an estate in Newport and she has managed to get herself to university but couldn't sustain the momentum required it's very outside of her world and so she can't continue at a very prestigious university that she goes to and she ends up 
in London at the restaurant and walks in to for a job and in a sense she's searching for a way to make her mark on the world she's 19 she still wants to burn brightly she's got all of this fierce desire to be something and she's fascinated with Chuli. um and there's a line in the book that you know both Sean and Chuli, well everyone in the restaurant is a little bit in love with Chuli, whether it's platonic or not because of this um, mesmerizing quality that he has but also the certainty that he has that one can do good even if you're deciding all the time what that good is and if you're making your own moral compass and that's a very attractive and I guess kind of sexy idea for Nia the idea that you can rip it all up and start again I wanted to come on to Tuli because he is he is enigmatic he's also a somewhat shady character um maybe what I'd call a flawed hero why did you want him to have this moral ambiguity? Yeah, the moral ambiguity was really important to me. Um, I think that when somebody is making moral choices, it's, it's, it's very rare that you could, any of us could make a moral choice and be entirely responsible for an ecosystem and for it always to be the correct choice. Um, and his position is, well, it's better to try. It's better to be, it's better to intervene um, rather than it's a sort of consequentialist thing, you know, what, what's the best thing for the greater good? What's the best thing overall? Should we just walk on by because we might get it wrong? Or should we intervene in every stage, whether it's um, giving money to somebody who's homeless or giving them a home or giving them a place to come or working with people who are um, in the red light district nearby or allowing people who deal drugs, in his case, to come to the restaurant. Um, if it means that he can do other things that he deems worthy, such as give legal aid to asylum seekers who need it, or help someone like Nia build a life for herself, um, help someone else go to university. Um, he's kind of connected at the dots, but I think there's a measure of hubris. And I thought that when there's hubris, there's exciting plot, right? Yeah. Okay. So the ambiguity is very important. I also like this idea um, that just like in Gatsby, you've got another character fascinated with the central character. And so that character, is, Gatsby's quite ambiguous for a lot of the novel because the person telling the story about him and trying to work out if he's a good person or not um, is, is not him. And so it's very important that Julie never, never offers interiority in that sense in the book. That you're, you know, you're getting two sides of him. He's a different person with Sean than he is with Nia. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I really like some of your characters are undocumented migrants, um, working hard, dreaming of running their own pizzeria. There's a tension between being an illegal refugee and a legal migrant. Why did you want to explore this? I really wanted a melting pot of everyone, economic migrants, refugees, um, EU, legal EU, um, somebody who is, seems, looks like they're legal, legal EU because they're white, but they may be something else. Um, what is legality in this context of borders and crossing borders? And when is it, when is the situation insufferable enough that you would deem that it was valuable to break the law? So I wanted this melting pot, you know, um, benefits, um, extra hours, all of the different grey areas that mean that somebody can survive. And indeed, as you say, in the kitchen, you've got, say, six um, Sri Lankan cooks, some of whom have been successful with their asylum applications and some of whom aren't. And when the police come calling or when immigration come to the restaurant, it's terrifying for those who haven't been successful yet or who are waiting on their applications and not for those who've been successful. Um, everything on some level, where, whatever you've been through, involves telling the right story, involves your story holding together. And another thing you were asking about research, but another thing that comes out is that the stress and strain of taking months to get to a country means your story doesn't always hold together when you're applying for asylum. Mm. There are many holes in the story and you can't, every time you tell it, it might be slightly different. This doesn't mean that you're lying. Or, as Tuli would say, why not lie about one thing so that you can seal the hole 
because the system is unfair. And all of these ambiguities are sort of very important. And that's why I wanted economic migrants with refugees. Um, or as you said, they're illegal refugees. They're also legal refugees there who've been successful. Um, were they just lucky because they were able to represent themselves in court and they could speak English or they managed to access legal aid or they managed to put together a story that was exactly the same the second time they told it or they didn't have um, they didn't have to get over a wife and child or what, what were the what were the what are the problems that mean that everything can fall apart yeah and that's what I wanted to come on to next actually because your story could have gone either way ending in tra tragedy or happily. And um, this is true for so many seeking asylum in this country. Um, it sometimes comes down to sheer luck. Did you know before you started writing what the ending would be, or did the story evolve as you were writing it? Yeah, the, you, you know, there could have been an awful ending. I, I, I was writing it and there was an awful ending. I was writing it and there wasn't an awful ending. It, I mean, I, it, it kept changing. I mean, the number of times it changed in my head while I was writing it um, is interesting because it really could have gone either way, as you know from having, that, I think as you know from having read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I think that the ending of a book is very important. It reveals authorial intention. It reveals what the author wanted to say or do. So you might write a book and write it completely intuitively. And then I do think you need to look at the ending and think, is that exactly what I wanted when you're redrafting or when you're back on the book? Because if you think about the books that really made you throw them against the wall in anger, they often because you don't like the ending, you know, or the ending doesn't feel commensurate with what you've gone through with the characters. It doesn't feel like it fits with character action. But obviously the real world and plots are a mixture of things that characters can control and outside forces that they can't control. And so when those two things come together, then plot can go either way. So yeah, we, we could, you know, there is an alternative ending. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it did keep me, you know, really turning to wonder what would happen. And then even in the last few pages, it was still, it could have gone either way. Do you believe that um, fiction can help encourage empathy and change mindsets? And if so, how? I think fiction is hugely important in changing mindsets. I think that the the kind of um, uh, the, the the kind of all-consuming quality of fiction, the fact that it's not, it doesn't have to be didactic. The fact that good fiction will welcome you into the world and allow you to walk in the shoes of the characters is so conducive to empathy. I don't think you can write good fiction unless you really force yourself to empathise with your characters. And if you've done that, then however unsavoury your characters, in some ways, your readers will empathise with them in others. Um, fiction is, is, has been a huge force, I think, for me in being able to empathise with, with lives other than my own. And I think it's also because you're not being shouted at, you're not being preached at. So even if fiction is political, good political fiction means that you, you, you're right there in the debris and the pieces of people's lives. You're right there feeling them right through to their fingertips as, you, as they wake up in the morning and go to bed. And that's why you can do something like in this book where you've got two completely different points of view. They're completely different different ages, cultures, races, class backgrounds. And yet, hopefully, you would empathise with both of those characters as, as the story is told. Hopefully, you don't only empathise with one rather than the other. That's the excitement of fiction, too. The excitement is that the same person, the same situation, the same world can be viewed through more than one pair of eyes. And there is a sense of community in the restaurant um, and the neighbouring area. Why is community important? I think community is in incredibly important in the book. And obviously it's something we're thinking about a lot at the moment in, during the pandemic and how um, those, um, the barriers between us can come down um, when you're under duress. In the, um, in, in, in the in You People, 
Tuli's operating on one level um, upon the idea of love thy neighbour. So his idea is that it's the X square miles from where he's standing where he can go out and see who needs help. Um, but uh, the flip side of that is that the restaurant is a place that draws people from all walks of life, from, from the laundrette, from the Chinese grocer opposite, from the Australian pub, from the betting station that's at the end of the road, um, or, or the bankers who come to eat at the restaurant. And, and so community is really interesting because the restaurant to me is a place where hopefully people just through proximity can see and hear and witness each other and be listened to. Um, but they're not community in the sense of being from an identical background. Um, so I think that that always fascinated me about the restaurant that the book is based, that the real life model for the restaurant. This idea that in London, we're all rubbing up against each other um, on the tube, on the bus, everywhere in a coffee shop and that sometimes dialogue and sort of a bleed through can occur between people from different backgrounds, yeah. And um, yes, I thought the restaurant was really, you know, I felt I'd been there. Um, it, was, it was beautifully drawn. Um, and I, I just wondered, do you write in restaurants? What is your writing process and routine? Yeah, I used to write in restaurants before um, the current state of affairs. So um, I, I, I've always liked writing in cafes and listening. I'm, I'm, I'm a big eavesdropper. Um, so I eavesdrop on the tube. I, I, I've always done that. But when you're writing a world that is um, set up, it's very different for me than when I'm writing, when I'm trying to create a novel so I've learned over time that process wise it's best to be it takes me a long time to arrange the furniture build the characters and do the first third of a book it can take a painfully long time to do that part and once I've got to the crux point which is at the end of the first third where everything's scattered and there's a big big problem that needs resolving usually then I can write anywhere after that so in terms of process then I would go at that point I could go to a cafe have some music have a coffee be in the world while I'm writing but for the first third it's good for me to be isolated and uninterrupted so I would normally try and write for up to four hours a day and I think four hours was a good writing day um, in a completely ideal world I would go for a walk listen to a short story um, in recent years, it's been a pleasurable thing that I've done. So I would just do a walk up about an hour, listen to a short story in that time, muse over it. And that feels very luxurious for me to be able to start the day that way. And then coffee and writing for four hours in uh, alone. So um, in a room alone in the house or in... Uh, an office where um, I also I also teach creative writing, so I have an office in that building. So I try and write for four hours there. Um, and sometimes it goes badly, and then I always tell myself one hour is actually enough because it means you stay in the world. So if three hours have gone in hellish procrastination and avoidance of the task at hand, even one hour is is incredibly valuable because you've stayed in the world. If you've written a page you've stayed in the world for that day and that means that your sub for me well my subconscious does a lot of work then in the intervening day and who have been your biggest literary influences oh well um i mean they're different for each book but um for, for overall i mean for i mean when i i started reading i mean i used to read a lot of south asian fiction um now I read a lot of different, a lot of different influences, but I would guess overall I would say that um, James Baldwin, Don DeLillo, and Mavis Gallant, the uh, short stories, um, Doris Lessing, they're they're sort of four biggies for me who I return to again and again. So I would look at their work when I'm in trouble. So I would take out a book and look at say just a single paragraph 
as this kind of life raft. And what about during lockdown then? Is there a particular writer you've turned to now? Well, lockdown, I've been judging a, um, judging a prize, um, a, 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 the nation's best second novels, Britain's best second novels. And so I've been reading a lot of second novels. Mm. Um, and so that's been quite exciting uh, because it means my reading's laid out for me. So I haven't been um, turning to a writer. That said, I just was having a break from it and I picked up Carol Phillips, the writer Carol Phillips, um, because I felt it I just feels it pertinent right now with everything that's happening. Yeah. And also just exquisite prose, um, just line by line, which can, I find can be a solace sometimes just to read a paragraph of perfectly crafted prose. He's very good at that. And what are you working on next um, in terms of your writing? Yeah, so I've, 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 got, a, I've, I've got a new book that I've just begun. Um, well, I've, I've, when I say I've begun it, I mean I've, I've worked out the world and what will happen in it. It's as yet unnamed, but it's set, at the moment, it's set in the home counties um, and it's set in a village. Um, and it's, a, a, it's, it's it, when, I, when I originally came up with the idea, which I have to think about now, um, it was on the day after the Brexit referendum and it's set with the um, in the home of a GP in the village um, and a disastrous crime takes place <laughs> um, which rearranges everything in that village um, and the GP and the GP of Indian origin and the villages the rest of the villages is, is mostly um, mostly not and um, that's the that's the book that I'm beginning um, but as usual, I'm beginning with a moral question. So the crime that takes place in the village raises a big question I don't know the answer to entirely. <laughs> and so I will, I will write the book in order to find the answer. But at the moment, the other thing I'm doing is writing the treatment for you people for the script. Oh, yes, it's been an option. The option. That must be so exciting. That's yeah. really exciting, yeah. Congratulations, so yeah. Thank you. So, it will make brilliant, brilliant viewing. Oh, thanks very much. So... It's, it's a new skill for me. I've, I've, written a, I've written an episode of a TV series um, recently. I've co-written an episode for a TV series, and so, which is BBC One and Amazon. So that, that, that means that I, I've got my hands fully dirty now. So I, I, I feel like I can do it now with my own book. Um, so I'm writing the treatment and thinking of it visually and also how you extend the world so that it can be a six part TV series. Mm. Um, so interestingly, thinking of anything new that could happen in the world that's not in the book. And that's actually quite fun for me because I haven't done that before. Great, well, thank you for that. Um, we do have time for a short reading. Do you have something that you'd like to read? Um, yeah. From your people? That From your people. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. But I'll have to go and get it. Because <laughs> I don't have it right here. Okay. Sorry about that. Just okay. give me one second. Okay. Yeah? So, just going to read from an early chapter from Nia. Great. In those days, they were all a bit in love with Julie. Everyone who worked for him in the restaurant, they couldn't help it. Somehow it came with the territory. A solid admiration, leavened with a kind of vulnerable, unrequited romance. Nia considered this oddity often. She really did mean all of them, male or female, front of house or in the kitchen. Take your pick. The waiting staff, Ava from Spain, the gaggle of South Asian cooks, Sean, Rajan, Gunnar, the Santan, even Ashen, the clipped French Tamil guy who shared the lease with him, purveyor of crucial expertise from working at the Pizza Express. This is how they appear to her, even though or well, maybe because Chile was so infuriating and endearing in equal measure. It wasn't just because they were beholden to him. You could argue that he had rescued everyone who was there from something or someone, but this was more to do with his manner, his way of being. When Nia started working there, she was proud of the fact 
that he didn't affect her. But soon enough, this indifference to his charms was undermined by the fact that she envied him. She wanted to be him rather than the object of his affection. He was so expansive, a bit arrogant with it, sure. But that heart, to possess such a heart, to look outward like that, rather than inward, to the hidden pockets of the self, as she did, an audacious heart. It seemed to thud against his lanky frame with its own strength and vibration, exulting in a freedom from the scrutiny of others. Great, thank you very much. It's been a delight talking to you and um, good luck with everything. And thank you, Nikita. Thanks so much, I've loved it.